Well, good morning. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. If you would stand as we begin our worship. so thankful that we can come and praise you this morning. And yes, Father, we can come and do it freely. Father, we are thankful for this place that you've given us, this country that you've given us. And that we can know that we can come to this place and not be persecuted, unlike many of those in this world. So, Father, we just want to lift up and thank those that have uh, invested their lives in so much and just making this a reality for us. And Father, we want to pray for our leaders at this time, that Father, that they would have hearts for you, that their morals, their ethics, their direction, Father, would be guided by you. 
So, Father, now we come and we also remember, Father, uh, just how fortunate we are, Father, again, that we can uh, just come and praise you and sing your praises. For we pray these things in Jesus' name.
sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus, Savior of the world. Jesus, Savior. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you have uh, braved the elements. And if you're a little damp around the edges by the time service is over, you'll probably be dried out and you'll be in good shape. We've come to the time in our service of communion, and I forgot earlier, but if you haven't picked up uh, bread and juice representatives, they're on the tables around the uh, uh, area here, and you can pick those up. Now, I was thinking about what I was going to say today, and uh, how many of you have probably experienced the same thing as me? I go to the store and I buy something or something's going on, and I'm asked to fill out a survey or give my opinion about this or that or whatever. Anybody get that thing? I mean, you can't go anywhere without somebody asking you, fill out this survey and you'll get a $500 gift card or something like that. So... So that, that kind of is what happens. You know, people are asking your opinion about all, all kinds of things. And I looked up what the word opinion meant. And it says a view or judgment formed about something, but not necessarily based on fact or knowledge. Anybody know anybody that ever jumped to a conclusion about something? You know, it happens all the time. In fact, sometimes that's their main... Uh, source of exercise, jumping to conclusions. <laughs> so anyway, Jeff over the couple months ago was bringing us messages from uh, the book of Mark. And as I was reading through there in chapter 8 uh, and in verse 7, I read this where Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Now, I don't think Jesus was conducting an opinion poll or whatever. I mean, if you turn on the news, that's what you get all the time. 95% of the people say this, and, you know, 60% of the people say that. Well, Jesus wasn't looking for uh, necessarily opinion, and uh, he was just, uh, I, I won't say making conversation, but asking his apostles, what have you been getting out of all this that as we have been going along? And uh, so... The apostles answer back and they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Well, and then a few weeks later, uh, I read this on a sign. You might have been driving up Arona Road and you saw, people have opinions, God has facts. Anybody see that sign? No, I guess I'm the only one who reads signs while I'm driving. <laughs> My wife tells me all the time, keep your eyes on the road. So, but anyway, and it struck me that people just, you know, when they're asked a question, they'll give you their opinion, right or wrong. It might not be based on facts or, or uh, knowledge. It's just, you know, they'll say something. And that's kind of, I think, what happened in this instance. I'm going to read this also, uh, the accounts given in Matthew, and in a little bit more detail, and I want to read what, uh, what transpired. So when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Well, and then they said, Well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked the disciples the real question, who do you say that I am? Well, Simon Peter, kind of the spokesman for the group, he answers and says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, another name for Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father 
who is in heaven. So where did Peter get his answer? John MacArthur is kind of a modern day theologian and pastor and uh, here's what he says about it. Never before had Jesus explicitly taught Peter or the apostles the fullness of his identity. God the Father had opened uh, Peter's heart to this deep knowledge of Christ by faith. Peter was not merely expressing an academic opinion about the identity of Christ, but this was a confession of Peter's personal faith made possible by a divinely regenerated heart. What's a divinely generated heart? Well, I think that's a, a mind or thoughts that are brought from the Holy Spirit through God the Father. So, who do you say Jesus is? That's really the question. And Jesus from that time on is starting to teach His disciples about what would happen in the future. About His persecution, crucifixion, and then resurrection. Well, I trust that God through the Holy Spirit has revealed to you personally that Jesus was the Christ. And the word Christ in Greek is Christo, which means the anointed one. He's the one who brought us salvation through His death, burial, and resurrection. And so this morning as we partake of the bread and the juice, let's remember to thank God as He instructed us for His provision of salvation to us. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we are before You and we answer the question, who do You say that I am? That we realize and thank You for the provision, as I said, that You have made. And that we have the hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity There will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to
starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is love break 
It is so good to have you with us this morning. Really appreciate you being here. Lots happening this summer here at NCC. Hope you got a bulletin on your way in with all the dates of things happening, the different events. We have our first chosen movie night this week, so I hope to see you there for that. A lot of kids' activities now that they're off for the summer, rain or not, they're going to happen. Uh, but really just excited that you're here. You can always scan that QR code in the seat in front of you, the QR code behind me. Uh, part of what happens when you scan that QR code, it goes part of our website that has the bulletin outline, the sermon outline you can fill out. Also has that connection card. You can fill it out online through that QR code or do the connection card in the seat in front of you. I would love for you to fill that out. Let us know any prayer requests you might have. If it is your first time here, we'd love for you to fill out that QR code and bring it to the welcome, not fill out the, fill out the connection card, bring it to the welcome desk. We have a gift for you uh, for being a first time guest here with us. We're really just uh, glad that you spent the morning worshiping with us. We also this week, uh, just this morning, had our students head out to their CIY trip, a week long trip down in Tennessee. Um, and so they gathered this morning to pack up and to pray for the trip and really ask you to pray along with us uh, for the trip this week. Um, that was them praying this morning out before service even started. Also be praying for the leaders on that trip. We know it takes a lot of endurance for those leaders, a lot of energy to get through the week and to pour into those students. So if you would be mindful of that this week. See, they laughed for service and I had no idea what they're laughing at. And so now I'm glad I looked behind me and saw that picture because I thought it was something I said, uh, which made me feel good, but then realized it wasn't. Uh, so let's uh, pray together for them and for our morning together. Dear God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for uh, the students and the adults that uh, left for our Christ and youth trip down to Tennessee, that they would have just a really impactful week learning about you, learning about your word and the different things that uh, you have and your spirit has in store for them. Pray also for us that our minds and our hearts would be open to your word this morning and all the things that uh, we have to learn from you, God, the things for life, the things to give you glory. I pray that just being here this morning will glorify you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been going over the names of God. In the first week, we covered this big name behind me, Yahweh. This personal name for God that was given to Moses as, as meaning the, the I am. I am who I am. I, I am the I am. I'm self-existent. And if you remember this name, Yahweh was given to Moses at a key time. He was, uh, had this experience with the burning bush. You remember? And it was God speaking through this burning bush and telling him he's going to be the chosen one to lead the people out of Egypt. And God would show up in great ways, but Moses would be the spokesman for Yahweh. And Moses had some great doubt. He said, there's, there's no way. And God said, Yahweh. Yeah, I was worried if that was, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it, I'll take it. Upstairs, they're ready for the laugh track button, right? Like, let's come through for Jeff a little bit. The last dad joke of the morning, sorry. Um, so anyway, so the same Yahweh, right? So we've been looking at the different names that come around Yahweh because God reveals himself in different ways through his name, his, his character, his personality, what he, he does for his people. And so we've been going through the last few weeks to these different names. And our one for this morning is Rapha, the God who heals, the healing God. And it comes not too far after this episode of God delivering his people out of Egypt. In fact, it's in your Bibles just a few chapters later in Exodus chapter 15. If you want to Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15 or scroll to Exodus 15. We're going to see that God shows up again at a key time to reveal that he is God, the healer, the healing God, the one who is personal with his people, shows up and heals. We're going to pick up in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 15. It said, when Moses had led the people led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink because it was bitter. 
That is why the place is called Mara. Seems appropriate. Call the place what it is. It's bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we going to drink? And Moses cried out to him and the Lord showed up, showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water and the water became fit to drink. When the Lord issued a ruling and instructions for them and put them to the test, he said, if you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, remember Lord right there, all caps is this Yahweh. Listen to Yahweh, do what is right in his eyes. If you pay attention to Yahweh's commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord, Rapha, the Lord who heals you. Now this is interesting because, well, these people know God. Why does God have to give them a new name? He just gave them Yahweh. Now why put this other name, Rapha, with Yahweh. Well, think about the context a bit. The context is that these people had been living in slavery for over 400 years, enslaved to the Egyptians. And yes, they had heard some great, huge things from God, and they had seen God work in miraculous ways like no one had ever seen before. I mean, all these plagues coming on the land of Egypt. And then God delivered them out of Egypt and he parted the Red Sea. I mean, water splitting into two. And then they were chased by the Egyptians who were still coming after them. And the waters went back and wiped these Egyptians out. And they're about to see God through this thunder of voice and fire and all this. And that's great. That's miraculous. That's huge. But here, Yahweh Rapha is personal. And he's saying, I'm not going to just be this concept out there, but I'm going to be involved in your life. So involved, I know the things that hurt you. I know the things that break you. I know the bitterness in life, and I'm going to show up, and I'm going to heal. Now, we, before we get to the blanks on your bulletin, there's, there's an assess, aside I want to make, kind of those parentheses to what we're going to talk about with God who heals. Because some of you know God Almighty and the the concept of God, but when it comes to God who heals, it might trip you up a little bit. And it might trip you up for some different reasons, because you've had pain in your life, you know other people that have pain in their lives, and you've asked God to be God the healer, and it seems like he has not come through. It seems like this doesn't make sense, because there's been a lot of pain and hurt. So let me make a parenthesis because I want you to still be open to God being the God of healer and open to the message of scripture this morning. And so I want to point out three different things to help us open up a little bit. The first thing is to realize that pain is always, often the gateway to healing. I mean, we're not going to have healing if there's not pain first. And so for us to even see God work in the world around us, often there's going to be Times of wilderness, and times of hurt, and times of pain. It's interesting when you think about whose idea was it to go out in the wilderness. It was God's idea for the Israelites here in Exodus chapter 15. It was was God's idea because God knew something was going to happen. There was going to be a gateway opened for them to see a personal God like they have never seen God before. But in order to see that, they had to go into the wilderness first. The second thing I want you to think about to be open to God being a healer is to realize that healing might look different than you expect. In your mind, you have what you want God to do, but God is not a magic genie that's going to come out of a lamp. And so your healing that God is bringing to you might look different than you ever thought it would look. I'm going to give an illustration. There's someone I came across that started this uh, wilderness ministry. He would, it started in the 1970s. He would take young boys out to mountaineering and do rock climbing and open them up to the concepts of God because of his, God's creation. His name, uh, the, the person that started this ministry was Tom Hansel. And Tom started this mountaineering and outdoor school to open up those to the concept of God, especially those that came from a hard background. And during one of these expeditions, he had an accident and 
lived after that with a lifetime of debilitating pain. Could never go out again doing rock climbing and mountaineering, the things he loved and the the things he was doing as a ministry to God to bring other people closer to God. He was never able to do that again. And he wrote a book years later called You Have to Keep Dancing. And in it, he wrote this line, I've prayed hundreds, if not thousands of times for the Lord to heal me. And he finally healed me of the need to be healed. He came to his realization in the point of his life that God may never bring him to a point where he wanted to be, but he could still do so many other things for God, even in the situation he was in. And so to open our minds that our healing might look different than what we would like God to do. But then the third thing, the third realization is to to open up our hearts and our minds to realize when I say healing, if you are simply thinking of physical healing, that is a misunderstanding of the depth of how broken and hurt we are as humans. There is a great amount of healing that each and every one of us need that go beyond just a physical healing of a hurt leg or an arm or cancer. There is hurt in the depths of our soul and our hearts. And so when God says he's Rapha, he means those addictions that started in childhood that we grew up with and the generational sins. And he means those things that are deep down in our hearts and our souls that we don't even know how to express because they've, they've been there for so long. There's been that dark spot on us that we don't know how to talk about them even with others until they come out in, in maybe violent or hurtful ways. And so when we talk about healing, we mean something even beyond the physical. It could include the physical, but we're going even deeper than that this morning. So I hope with those three things out of the way, you open up your mind and heart to God being the the God of healing in your life, in your heart, in your soul. Now, there's some preachers in our day and age that will take a passage about healing and flip it on us, right? And say, well, if we do this, if we do that, if we send in a bit of money, we're going to see some healing. But often those are not very true to the text, They're not faithful to what scripture is actually saying. And if you look at this passage in Exodus 15, we see that it's a lot more about God than it is about us. And so I want to look at the passage in light of that. What does this passage and what does this name, Yahweh Rapha, teach us about God? How do we see the world around us and God differently when we see God as healer? So here's the first thing when we see God as healer. We see, we see God as he really is. This, is. this is who God is. God is healer. He, he, he really is. And again, in the context, first time they had seen God in this way. It's mind-blowing to think that it wasn't enough for God to be seen as this, this mover of great miracles. This, this one that had power over all other power to, to control the seas and to control nature and control people. That wasn't enough for God to be seen in that, but God had to reveal himself even more as Yahweh Rapha. God wanted to be personal. God wanted to step into their lives and say, no, 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 I don't just see people as, as a sea of faces. I see people as individuals that have needs and hurts. And so he steps in in this moment and it's something like water, but he's willing to do something about it. And now for you and I, we may, we may see an episode like this and even hear this name Yahweh Rapha and maybe it doesn't hit us as much because, well, we're used to that. We have verses in the New Testament like Hebrews Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, and it's something that maybe we've heard before, a concept we've heard before, and so it doesn't hit us the same way. Hebrews 4 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our need, in our time of need. And so we have a whole list in the bulletin of needs that we have because we believe this truth from Hebrews that we can approach the throne room of God with prayer. To say, God, we have this happening in our life. We have this loved one that is hurt. 
We have this person going through a situation. We've experienced loss in this family, so we pray for this family. And, and, and we have the benefit of understanding the full scripture and knowing that because of what Jesus did for us, we can approach God in this way. Maybe, maybe sometimes even to a fault that we don't even appreciate God for being this personal God. We've lost sight of just how, how confident we can come before God because of what he did. But again, for those Israelites, this is the first understanding they have that they can come to God to be healed, that they have a God that cares for them personally. But this is who God is. This is his normal mode of operation to care for you, to step into your life, to be part of the healing process for you. So that's one of the things that we see when we approach the scripture and see God as Rapha, God as healer. But then look into ourselves a little bit more. When we get to experience healing in our lives, we, we get to see life as it was intended to be. We get to see life as it was intended to be. What I mean by this is life as we live it is not the context God wanted us to live life in. The place we were supposed to live, the, the context we were supposed to be is what we see very beginning of scripture, Genesis, in the Garden of Eden. God created this paradise, this place where there was no death, no cancer, no miscarriages, no infertility. It was, it was a place of joy and perfect fellowship with other humans. But through Adam and Eve, sin entered the world and it it brought all of that. It brought death and destruction and hurt and tears and anger and violence. And years, centuries later, it's reverberated to you and I as we live our lives. And all of that has just increased throughout those centuries. And we find our place, ourselves in a place where it was never intended for us to be. But this is, this is where we are. Another word in the definition for Rafa is repair. And as God repairs those things around us, as he heals us and our, our relationships with others or the situations we find ourselves, he is bringing a bit of Eden back and he's repairing it to that which it was always intended to be. And so God desires to bring that in because that's who he is. I think we get a picture of this in Psalm Psalm 103, it's an amazing picture as we get to see just what God could do for us and the joy that it brings, bring us back to how we, God intended it to be. Verse 2 of Psalm 103, it says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This is this picture of how it was always intended to be, to be renewed to your youth. Something I thought about this week as I helped my kids, we're trying to build a, a tree house in our backyard. And I find myself generally handy when it comes to those things. But I also find myself relatively cheap. And so when it comes to buying the right tools or doing the right thing to fix it and, and knowing that, well, the right tool or the right part costs a lot, so maybe I'll try to do something with what we have already. And so we're building this tree house and we have these nails, they're really long nails. I was like, oh, go through, attach those two boards together. This would be perfect. But it was going to be a little too long. I was trying to justify, well, it's still going to work, right? But having nails sticking out of boards on a treehouse that kids are climbing on. But I don't really want to go out and get the right size from Home Depot just to trip by itself. And this is going to be difficult. And as I was thinking about this message this week, I thought, isn't that how we are? Isn't that how it feels living where we're just not the right tool and it just feels like we're just trying too hard, right? And then I watch a YouTube video on it. It's like, man, why is it so easy for them? Oh, because they have the right tool. And so for God in our healing, God often in our healing will, will bring it to a place where we go, oh, this is how it was always meant to be. This is, this is what brings joy and purpose. 
And this is, is what it's like to be the right tool in this world. But then oftentimes when we're, we're praying for healing or, or oftentimes when we're trying to do it ourselves, bring our own energy, our own efforts and thinking, well, this is how I would do it. So I'm going to live this way. And things start falling apart because you're not doing it the way God wanted you to do it. And it's, it's the wrong tool for the job. And so when we get to see God step up into life and, and, and heal, we see Rafa, we see a bit about how life was always intended to be. Number three is a little bit about us as well, but it's, it's about us because of what God did. We see the worth that God gives us. When we see Rafa, when we see healing in our life, we see the worth that God gives us. See, when something needs to be repaired, there's always a cost. Several weeks ago, I told you about the motorcycle accident I was in. And for those that ride motorcycles, the first thing you asked me was, how's the bike? <laughs> I said the same thing to all of you. I said, well, it's okay. It, it runs, but it's really scraped up. It was 25 years old already. It's not, it's not worth fixing. It's not worth the money and the investment to get things back to how it was again, because it, it, was, it was to begin with and it's just not worth fixing. The things we fix are the things that we feel have worth. And so for God to show up in your life shows you the worth that he has placed on your life. And the greatest worth that God has put into our lives is to give his one and only son. That's the price he was willing to pay gladly because you are worth it. And we see a picture of this in Titus. And Titus, we'll see, shows just how hurt we were and the need we had for God to show up. And he does in a huge way. Titus chapter three, verse three. It says, at one time, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. You see the need for healing that we have as humans, all of these descriptors for us. Verse 4, but when, when the kindness and the love of our God Savior appeared, He saved us, He healed us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. What was the price he was willing to pay for that healing and repair to come? Verse 6, when he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. God saw the brokenness and hurt of the world. And, and he didn't give up. He said, well, it's too far gone anyways. He stepped down and said, I'm going to send my son Jesus to fix it because they're worth it. And not only to fix it, but to give my presence of the Holy Spirit on these people and still not enough to give them the promise of eternal life. So we get to spend eternity with our father because you're worth it. Now, Joshua last week mentioned some of the lies that Satan has for us. And I think the lie of not being worthy enough is one of the great lies of the father of lies, Satan. It's a lie that's whispered to us in different ways to convince us that, you know what, I'm not worth it. Maybe, maybe it doesn't seem like a lie of Satan. It just seems like we're following the world. And the world's saying I'm not good enough by myself. And so I need to try harder. I need to do more. I need to buy more to be worthy enough. And, and so we do that for our life. And we're so engrossed in all of that. We don't have time for the things of God. And, and we listen to the lies of the world, the lies of Satan. That becomes so loud in our life. And maybe for you, it is that lie. It's that lie that no, you're not, you're not good enough on your own, and so you need to collect, you need to buy, you need to look a certain way. You need to remember the truth of God's word in Matthew chapter 5, that God sees you so much more beautiful than the, the wild flowers of the field. Maybe you've been listening to the lie of Satan that, that you know what, you're just too bad, you're too broken, you're too hurt 
to be repaired. You need to listen to the truth of God's word in Ephesians 2, that God's love is rich and full of mercy. And maybe it's the lie of Satan that you're just not good enough. You're too weak. You need to remember the truth of God's word in 2 Corinthians, that God's love is made perfect in your weakness. Maybe you've been listening to the lie of Satan that Joshua talked about last week of loneliness. That maybe you, you seem all alone in this world and if people have left you alone, man, it sure feels like God has left you alone. You need to listen to the truth of God's word in Luke chapter 12 that even the hairs on your head are numbered by God because that's just how much he cares for you. Maybe it's been far too long since you've picked up the truth of God and those lies of Satan have become all too powerful in your life. Know that you are worth so much to God. And as parents, we need to present the truth of God to our children that will drown out any lie the world or Satan may be telling them. Because it's way too easy for them to pick up a phone or see a video and go, man, that's what it's like to have success. That's what it's like to have this. That's what I need to strive for. When God all along is saying, no, I want to pick you up and heal you. I want to be part of it. But the lies of Satan are drowning out the truth of God. And so we need to be the loudest voice in their lives. When we see God healing in our life, we get to see that we are worth it. God is willing not to just leave us in the wilderness, but to show up in the hurt and pain and bring something back to life. The last thing we see when we see God as Rapha, the last thing we'll talk about this morning, is we get to see the beauty of the gift. We get to see the beauty of the gift. The beauty that There are things in life to have joy and happiness and gratitude for. And there's a saying that often we don't know what we have till we miss it, right? Till it's gone. And sometimes that happens in our pain and our hurt. We come to appreciate the things that we had before that we didn't even realize we had before. Maybe for these Israelites, like I never thought about getting fresh water before because we just had it where we are. And now we come to appreciate it a little bit more, but even more than appreciating the gift of water, that's not what the point of this story was at all. It's to appreciate the gift of God and the giver of that gift. That God was able to take something that was bitter and turn it into something fresh. I don't think it's a mistake. I don't think it was out of, out of convenience the way that God worked out this miracle that Moses saw a piece of wood and it wasn't that they went to a different pool or a different place, but he took that piece of wood, threw it into the bitter water and it became drinkable. It became fresh water. There's, I think, a theological significance about about God turning something that which was bad into something that was good. There's a truth about this in Ezekiel. I just read this a few weeks ago, but I wanted to read it again because of what it means for you and I and our message about healing. Because ultimately, this healing that they had for this water was something more than just the water. Three days after the most miraculous thing that has ever happened on the face of the earth happened to these Israelites, and they saw every bit of it as they were delivered out of Egypt. And what are they found doing three days later? Grumbling, complaining. Well, we're better than them, right? (laughs) Verse 26 of Ezekiel 36. I think this is really what God was doing here with this miracle. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of stone of flesh. See, God knew that what they were doing was really a reflection of that that hurt, that deep pain in their heart. And so, yes, God was healing the bitter water, but he was also healing their bitter hearts and taking them from this, this place of stone cold towards 
God and this personal revelation of who he was and being part of their lives and opening them up to a fresh reality that God really does care for them and God really will bring them through this. It's the same promise for you and I. And oftentimes we can be cold towards God and say, well, I don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah, but God caused this in my life and he wants to open up that heart and take it apart, take it away and turn it into a heart of flesh. There's a beautiful scene in the Lord of the Rings movies. And if I'm honest with you, if you're going to be here long enough here at NCC, I'm probably going to give you the entire script of the Lord of the Rings as we go through some sermons over the years. And so just do yourself a favor, watch the movies if you haven't. And then when I bring it up, you'll be like, oh, I know what he's talking about now. Okay. So seen in the last movie towards the very end, they throw this ring into Mount Doom and they destroy the ring because things were the, the evil was infecting the world, right? But they did what they had to do, throw the ring in the fire. And Sam, who was on this adventure to throw it in there, says something very profound. And I think it applies to what we're talking about today. He wakes up, he sees someone, he says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happening in the world? And I think it's interesting that he says, is everything sad going to come untrue? It's different than saying, is everything sad going to be taken away? Is everything sad going to be forgotten about? But he says, is everything sad going to be untrue? And I think there's something to be said about that. Just as we see in the bitter waters here in Exodus 15, it's not just replaced, it's not just given something new, but God is able to turn it in to something good and to make it untrue. And for you and I, as we think about all the the hurts and pains and the circumstances that you came from this morning and the things that you've been praying to God for years about, to make it untrue. And it's a promise for each and every one of us as Christians that one day we do have the promise of eternal life, the promise that one day everything sad will come untrue. We see it in the book of Revelation chapter 21, verse five, who is seated, he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I'm turning it that which it was in the sadness and the hurt and the pain and I'm restoring it. I'm fixing it. I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. We have a lot of questions when it comes to pain and hurt in our world. We have a lot of questions about the cause of that pain and that hurt. Because there is a lot of pain when it comes to our hurt. And and there's some things we can think about that hurt. There's mirages we can believe about our hurt. And when I say mirage, it's this false sense of what we feel like God should do with that hurt. God, if you just took it all the way. Maybe it's a hurt that we've been choosing for ourselves for years. It's a choice we keep making. And God's saying, I want you to get out of that, but you're choosing to stay in that. Maybe it's a relationship that we're part of that's, that's causing hurt in our lives. Maybe it's, maybe it's just universal hurt. Right? We live in a, in a world that has diseases and COVIDs and deaths and cancers and miscarriages. And, and I wish I could step into every single one of your lives and we could sit down in my office and you could explain the hurt that you're going through. And I could, I could give you an answer that might satisfy you for a moment. But the truth is we don't have an answer to all of that. But what I want you to hear the most is that in that wilderness, in that pain, in that hurt, that is exactly where God shows up. And it's the invitation into your life to be personal and to have healing, maybe in a way you didn't expect. Maybe you would have chosen it differently. But it's to have healing, maybe for the greatest healing that you need. And that's the healing of your sins, the healing of the death that we all face. The passage in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sins 
in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And so in your deepest need, the invitation is made by Jesus on the cross to do something that we could never do ourselves and to heal us. John's going to sing a special song for us this morning. And during the song, I just, I want you to stay seated. I want you to think through what, what he sings and the truth of, of us all being prisoners to our sin, being prisoners to the pain and hurt that we have in life. But that God made a way for Jesus to come at a great cost so that you and I can have freedom and have healing.
<clears throat> I know that's true for John because we've talked about it, John. We've talked about the prisons he's been in and how God has healed him. We want that to be true for everybody. When we open our hearts, allow God to replace our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh and be open to God's work in our lives. If you need somebody to talk to about that, we have members of our prayer team over at our prayer cove. would love to talk to you about that, lift you up in prayer. Allow God to hear your request to come into your life and be Yahweh Rapha and heal you of those things. If you need to fill out that connection card, let us know how we can be praying for you that way or connect with us. We'd love to do that as well. But I'm going to ask you to stand with us. We're going to sing one last song before we go as, um, as we continue to remember what God has done for us and the invitation by Jesus. Let me pray for us before we sing. God, you are a, a, a great God. It's who you are. When we see you heal, it's, it's, it's seeing you as the God that you are. It's seeing you as a God that cares. It, it reminds us just how great that gift is. It reminds us of the worth that we have and the worth you've placed on us. And so God, because of that, we ask for your healing power in the depths of our soul and the dark places of our heart to repair us to how life was meant to be lived. So God, I pray that we would live that out this week as you continue to be part of us and part of this church here at NCC. Pray all of this in your son's name. Amen.